15. All right, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Thank goodness. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm number six of five, so you're very patient. Um, uh, I, I'm also um, been asked to give you a short history of London, uh, but I can't spin it out over 15 minutes. Um, I will try. Uh, the, um, th there are about a thousand books on London history, and you don't need another one. However, uh, challenged to do one, I tried to think if there was anything I could say about London that hadn't been central, said already. Uh, and I hope there is something. Um, the book I've written is a classical history of London. They're all there. Julius Caesar, Dick Whittington, Charles Dickens, Boris Johnson, everyone uh, you could possibly want to hear about. Um, but the thing that interested me was what was it about London that I found, A, so fascinating as an eternal resident, but also what makes London so different from every other big city I know? Uh, and London is completely unlike any other big city I know. It looks different, uh, its character is different, it's much more diverse, its architecture is more different. Um, it has it scenes of, of great beauty and of great ugliness. Why is it so diverse? Why does one third of all Londoners have, have a garden which is unknown in any other city in the world? There's all sorts of things about London that I found extraordinary. How did it come to pass? Now, I'm going very quickly to give you part of an answer through three traumas that London's been through. Um, and these traumas illustrate one point about London which is, I think, unique. London has never ever done what it's been told by someone else. It's a city that simply goes about its business. It's been phenomenally safe. It's virtually the only city on earth that's never been attacked, besieged, raped, pillaged, um, demolished, uh, uh, all these things. London's managed to escape them. Uh, it's been a very, very lucky place to live, and we ought to remember that whenever we think how awful it might be. Um, but the three, the three um, uh, traumas that I want to talk about um, uh, are cases where London was told to be like something by someone else and refused. The first case uh, is Roman London. Uh, this is Roman London um, in the, uh, the third century AD. Um, it looks like uh, any Roman castra. In other words, it's full of straight lines. Uh, in 410, the Roman Empire collapses. The Romans disappear. London, you remember London was founded by Italians. A bunch of Italians founded London. Uh, it was taken over by a bunch of Danes, then a bunch of Germans, then some French people. Um, the English don't come into it. Uh, London is an immigrant city, thank God. Um, but um, when the Romans left in 410, um, we don't really know what happened next, except that they clearly left. Uh, who were they? Who was left behind? All we know is that for a century and a half, London disappeared from the map. Uh, the Londoners who survived appear to have moved upstream to the Strand, the beach, uh, where they conducted their business then. Um, they settled around the old market, the old wick, the old witch. Uh, and um, for about a century and a half, that's where London was. It was called London Wick. Uh, and I may say, I was delighted the other day to be uh, walking around the old witch. A cafe bar has opened in the Aldwych, next to the hotel there, called the London Wick. And I went in there and I said to the guys there, I said, look, you guys, do you realize you could well be the oldest cafe in Europe? Why did you make something of it? <laughs> they were from Bulgaria. <laughs> I had no clue what I was talking about. But it's there, the London Wick. Go there, um, try their coffee. Um, but what happened was that, that, um, that after about a century and a half, London has began to drift back to the, um, the old city, the old hills around, around Walbrook. But where they drifted back to had probably been small holdings, um, bits of farm, um, cattle ranches or something, in the old wards of the city. No archaeological re record is, is, is detectable of anything in that city for a century and a half. And yet when they came back to it, they appeared not to go back to the streets of the Roman city. They came back to the alleys, lanes, footpaths between the fields, which was in the, city, in the walls of the city of London, um, and called them their streets. And when Alfred the Great did the plan of London uh, as a borough in the, in the, uh, in the 8th century, uh, 8th, 9th century, um, he's, his street pattern was the street pattern of the lanes and alleys between the fields, and they all wind. And the reason why the streets of the city of London wind is because they had nothing to do with the Romans' attempt to impose a pattern on the streets. It was, it was the, the desire lines of people wandering through the fields of what was the city of London. And to my delight, you can walk through the city of London today and you will see every few yards some ridiculous passage 
alleyway, lane, courtyard, um, leading to nowhere in particular, which for some reason or another has not been filled in. And the city corporation planners, who will commit any outrage under the sun in the name of architecture, for some reason or another, regard these alleyways as sacred. And the reason why London buildings look so bizarre, the skyscra skyscrapers and their shapes, is they've got to fit into Alfred the Great street pattern on the street below. It's that mad. Uh, London became a standard medieval city. Um, uh, when uh, Edward the Confessor arrived, uh, a French-speaking man, he hated London. They spoke English there. Uh, he said, I don't want to go to this place that is Danish and English. Um, I'm going to pitch camp in, um, in my minster in the west, Westminster. Uh, this is the, the, um, the hall, uh, built a bit later, uh, and with Westminster Abbey in the background. Um, Westminster became the home of power, the home of the king, the courts, um, uh, law, power. Uh, the city was the home of money, and it's still the same today. It's a twin city, uh, and I still get a kind of buzz. If you get on a number 11 bus in the city, city, city of London, down Fleet Street, along the Strand, into Whitehall, I still feel that sort of tension between power and money. Uh, the, the city corporation said, we'll give you money if you leave us alone. Uh, the power said, uh, you give us money, we'll leave you alone. And that bargain remains to this day. The London police don't go into the city of London. It has its own police force. Uh, the king or queen will not go into the city. Uh, she has to be met at the border by the mayor. Um, this tradition runs right through uh, English history. It's about a twin city. And the story of London is the story of, a twin, of, of, that, sort of that sort of twin. Um, Westminster uh, developed very fine buildings, the buildings you normally associate with the court. Uh, city Corporation had nothing. It wasn't, it wasn't a city hall. didn't have a mansion house until the 18th century. Um, all it was doing was making money and leaving the, 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 the idiots of the court to get on with things uh, up west somewhere. Uh, and this is, uh, this is medieval Westminster compared to the other one. Now, um, gradually the two cities merged, obviously, as is, is the case. Uh, the early development took place um, uh, along the Strand. This is the first serious uh, housing development in the London suburbs, um, uh, Covent Garden. Earl of Bedford decides he wants to build houses, make some money, uh, applies to the Privy Council for permission. He's told, yes, you can have permission. Um, the king hated the Earl of Bedford because he signed a petition of right. Um, but you're going to uh, build it like they do in Paris, uh, around a square. Uh, you're going to have to put a, a, a chapel in it. Uh, I insist on a chapel in it. Um, you're going to give me £2,000, which was millions of pounds then. Uh, and you're going to use my architect, Inigo Jones. That was planning permission. Uh, and, um, and it sort of set the tone. Uh, the Earl was so furious. He, he said, I'm going to put a market and make some money in the middle of the square, not realizing that markets are not the best way of selling the properties along the fringes of them. And Covent Garden never really made him any money at all. Uh, the market stays there to this day. It wonderfully, uh, um, uh, so, um, you can't get rid of it. Um, but the second trauma um, came with the fire of London. Uh, while the ashes of the, of the buildings are still burning, uh, Christopher Wren, um, seeing a good contract coming, um, does a plan for a new city, uh, takes the city, the, 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 that, those are the walls of the old Roman city. Um, Christopher Wren, I think not knowingly, more or less redesigned the old Castra that the Romans had tried to impose on London. Takes it to Charles II, Charles II says, it's wonderful. Christopher Wren says, you're going to be like Rome, Sixtus V Rome, uh, this, is a, this, is, this is the city of the future. Um, uh, you know, Charles II said, right, let's do it. Um, takes it to the city corporation. City corporation said, get stuffed, ripped it up, told everyone to go and build where they were before. The streets of the city of London are still the streets of the pre-fire, not the post-fire. Uh, the plan got absolutely nowhere. Do not tell Londoners what to do with their city. Uh, what happened next, of course, was interesting because um, London effectively exploded out of the city. No one wanted to live in the old city. It took decades for it to be properly rebuilt. But they wanted to build in the areas around London, uh, and uh, particularly for people who are leaving the city. Uh, the London Square became the defining form, urban form for London. This is St. James's Square, uh, built after the Restoration uh, by, uh, by St. German, uh, by German, Edward German. Um, it was um, astonishing to foreigners. They couldn't understand how aristocrats coming to London would want to live in a house contiguous with the neighbors next door. It's disgusting. <laughs> um, but uh, it was hugely fashionable. It was fashionable because, of course, everything that was smart was in front. Everything that was not smart was tucked in behind, the mews, the stabling, and so on. It was a perfect form for a dignified city, which was not 
crushed within defensive walls. We didn't need defensive walls. So while Paris and Vienna um, were jamming ever more people into tenement blocks in, in, in palaces in the center, London could just spread, and London spread. Uh, and for two centuries, this is the way London developed, right out to around here. The pattern is the, still the pattern of St. James's Square. Um, Jonathan Swift um, thought it was absolutely sensational. He wrote a wonderful diary entry, going to see the Earl of Ormond in, in uh, St. James's Square. I, could, I, could have, I had coffee with the Earl on the ground floor. I had a chat with his wife on the first floor. I flirted with his daughter on the third floor, second floor. Um, but I couldn't get the maid up to the attic. She said she, said she, she, said she was too beautiful. Um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was curiously a new pattern of living. And it was very, very popular. Um, but um, but the, the, the effect of this was a huge uh, development of London over land. Um, nothing in Europe compared remotely with London. Europe was still within walls. European cities was, was within walls. Uh, London was over land. Uh, Middlesex, Hertfordshire, Essex, um, subject to this uh, um, Cruikshank cartoon, um, you see the terraces of London on the march out over, uh, out over the surrounding home counties, uh, bombarding the hayricks with, uh, with, with bricks and slate. Uh, the first sort of nimbies, terrified by this threatened onslaught. Um, but the result was that London just simply grew and grew and grew. Uh, by, the, by the end of the 19th century, um, London was, was by far the biggest city in Europe. Uh, and indeed, by the beginning of the 20th century, it was the biggest city in the world. Between 1880 and 1930, London increased in area by six times. Uh, nothing had been seen like that anywhere on Earth. Um, and it was, it was the greatest city on Earth as such. Now, the third trauma uh, came with the, uh, with the Blitz, with the war on the Blitz. But the trauma wasn't the Blitz. The Blitz possibly demolished a third of London. That was all. It was what happened next that was completely different and was traumatic. And this is the man responsible. And the, the, the last third of my book <coughs> takes off from this point. Uh, Patrick Abercrombie appointed city planner by the government in the war. Um, after the war, he said, right, we've won the war. We now win the peace. And when you've won the peace, you have the right to redesign your capital city. You knock it down and start again. And that's what Patrick Pat Abercrombie intended to do. And the London plan, published after the war, uh, effectively demolished 60% of London and rebuilt it suitable for uh, modern living, clean living, the motor car, above all the motor car. Uh, and um, after Abercrombie became a man called Buchanan, Buchanan said the essence of the, of the city must be the motor car. The ground floor of the city should be for cars. People should be on decks up above them. That simply was the plan for London. Uh, and um, this is Fitzroy Square uh, in the Abercrombie plan. Um, and it's effectively the whole of London. Uh, as you see, decks with escalators getting up and down from buses and cars. <clears throat> but the ground is really for, um, for transportation. Um, I find it difficult to persuade people that this was the case. This was the plan for London from the 1945, 1946, right through to 1973, a very important date. Uh, the, um, the plan was virtually uh, inoperable. It was fantastically expensive. It had five ringway motorways around London. Um, ringway one, uh, the famous motorway box, was going to demolish more houses than the Luftwaffe ever demolished. Uh, it was going to destroy communities right along their belt. It was hugely destructive. Um, the only one that did get built, more or less, was the Barbican. Um, now, there may be people here who live in the Barbican. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> That's what I can say. It is a catastrophe of planning. Um, uh, the, the, the ground floor of the Barbican was devoted to, either to cars or to um, private, park, for private um, gardens. Um, but the essence of the Barbican was the deck. Uh, and it's still there, poor old deck of the Barbican. Um, there are more people in this drawing on the deck than there are on the deck today, I tell you. Um, uh, it, it is really very sad, uh, and although it's lovely for people who live there, uh, they have their car, they have three, three floors of car parking in the most expensive land in Europe. It's unbelievable. Um, uh, but there it is, um, and it's now listed, God help us. But, um, <laughs> but, but the, real, the real lesson of Abercrombie, I'm afraid, was this. I mean, where it got used, it was, it re was reduced to this. And these are the towers, um, a, a few desperate houses. Goodness knows why that survived, probably a pub. 
um, uh, um, uh, um, Churchill Gardens in Pimlico was an early Abercrombie uh, thing, not that bad in, of, its, of its form, um, but, but it was very, very expensive. Um, it, the, 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 the driving a mile of road through, um, it was going to be through, through Camden, Kensington, uh, Clapham, um, right through you know, the heart of London, a, th a six-lane motorway. Um, the M25 was going to come right round uh, inner London, and there were going to be three of them. Um, it, it, to me, it was, uh, it was the nearest London ever got to um, a totalitarian revolution, and the people simply rose up against it. Um, they rose up against the motorway box. As a young journalist, I remember covering these events. Um, they rose up against the Covent Garden scheme. This was the Covent Garden residents uh, marching against it. Um, Covent Garden was going to be 35 acres, the same size as the Barbican, and it was going to be the Barbican replaced. So by, in, in, by the early 70s, the plan said London is going to be decked. Uh, you can still see um, some buildings, uh, New Zealand House, um, Castrol House on, 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 on Marylebone Road. You, they've all got decks. They were to be plugged in to the Great Deck. Uh, you see them along uh, up on uh, Thames Street in the city, which had quite a lot of decking built into it. Um, but 1973, um, really, there was the nearest London ever came to a popular revolution. Uh, the motorway box inquiries were violent. Uh, the, um, the Covent Garden plan um, was, was bitterly opposed by residents. Uh, 1973, it was all torn up. Uh, the plans collapsed. The plan to replace Piccadilly Circus with a second centre point was abandoned. The plan to demolish half of, um, half of, uh, of, um, uh, of Whitehall from Downing Street to the Palace of Westminster was going to be demolished and the second London Wall was going to go up there. Um, you cannot imagine what people intended to do to London in that period when many of you were not born or some were still young. But it was a devastating proposal which survived 20 or 30 years um, purely because planners terrified politicians into thinking there's no alternative to this. Uh, and that's why I think 1973 is one of the greatest years in London's history. Uh, it was the year when, frankly, we revolted and wouldn't put up with it. Um, what came in was the conservation area. Half of central London is now conservation area, thank God. But in between, dear old London, which had been told what was good for it and had said no in 1973, the bits in between the conservation areas are where the tall buildings have gone up. Uh, you'll see them around Victoria, Maida Vale, you see them in Notting Hill, um, uh, and anywhere that there's no, um, no sort of uh, um, control operating, tall buildings go up. And here you've got the famous view, this is my last slide, um, from Waterloo Bridge. And I took a Roman friend of mine, Italian friend of mine from Rome, <clears throat> to that one day, and uh, I sort of stopped, and he got out and looked at the view, and he gasped. And he said, I come from the world's most corrupt city. We wouldn't get away with that. Uh, who did you pay? I, and I said, in London, I'm afraid you don't have to pay anyone. We just don't care enough. And although there are people who find that exciting, and there are times when I find it exciting, and I find the horrors I see in London as maddening as the joys I get out of it. I love the city, but it drives me up the wall. Um, when I see that, I think what a terrible, what a terrible opportunity missed to group the, the skyscrapers or to plan the skyscrapers or to do them differently. We just shove any old rubbish up, just get, get the money. Um, uh, all I know from 1973 is if you do fight back, you can sometimes win. So come on, fight back. Thank you very much.